Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Karen McMullen, and I'm a New York City-based film editor and educator and film festival programmer. I work for a number of festivals around the city. I work for Tribeca and Doc NYC, the Tide Film Festival, but the festival that's nearest to my home is the African Film Festival. Thank you for joining us today. We're here talking with filmmaker Ngozi Omra, and she's going to talk to us about her two wonderful films that you've seen in this series, Coffee Colored Children and Shoot the Messenger. Welcome, Ngozi. Hi, thank you for having me. How are you doing? How's quarantine treating you? Uh, I don't know how to answer that question anymore. <laughs> I do have toilet roll. So. <laughs> It's come to that. Yes. <laughs> toilet paper, right? So there's so much to talk about in your films. I first saw um, Coffee Colored Children years ago uh, at a woman makes movie screening, I believe, in the city. And it stuck with me all these years. And I watched it again when I knew I was going to speak with you. And, um, you know, the scene with the white guy smearing the feces on the door is still as chilling now as it was then. So your um, one white white mother and your Nigerian father has influenced a lot of your worldview, of course, and your work. So let's talk a little bit about the short first, and we'll hop into the future. Is that okay? So um, this is a semi-autobiographical piece, right? Um, talk. I would say Coffee Colored Children is entirely biographical. Entirely, yeah, okay. Talk to us about what it's like putting some of your more poignant and, and painful memories on screen. Um, well, that's what's really funny about the whole Coffee Pillow Children thing. Um, so many people say that, you know, it was uh, really brave and it was really to put it all out there and to be so personal and what have you. But really, um, all that stuff was inside me, and really, I couldn't. I just couldn't move on. It was. I had to make that film in order to move on. There was no alternative. It was part. The film itself was part of me defining me, and me dealing with my past. And I guess you know, had this been LA, I would have gone to the therapist, but I didn't. So I made the film instead, and um, and there was just no alternative. But do those things that say those things and do those things because that is the story of what happened. And for instance, the um the, the scene with, that you talked about with the, the white boy, the white skinhead, sorry, uh smearing the door with um dog poo. I mean that was a, an incredible scene to film and see because the thing is, you know, as you growing up and these things are happening to you, you're the one that internalizes the shame about the things that are happening. And, you know, the shame that the dog who was on our door, nobody else's door, that it's my mum that had to clear it, because she had darky children and da 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 da. But when you saw the visualization of the scene, when you saw the guy, and I saw it, yeah, the guy doing that to our front door, it was like, it was almost like it was it brought my sanity back. It was like, no, that was completely obscene. That was an obscene, horrible, nasty thing to do. And I was right to be upset about it. And it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my mum's fault. Mm -hmm. It kind of made me feel sane again as well when you actually see it mm -hmm. what's happening. Mm -hmm. That's great. So it seems like it served its purpose of uh, clearing your head so that you can move on with your life. Yeah. One of the, the, the last lines in your film was um, you didn't want to, something to the effect of you didn't want to have children because you didn't want to give your world, your child to a world that was so, so ugly. I don't remember the exact name. Because a lot of times with biracial children, they're often seen, um, they're often seen as the evidence that the world is uh, beautiful and people are coming together, or they feel an incredible pressure to be the kind of um, the in-betweens, the people that you know talk to these and this and bring them together. And what I was saying at the end of the film was um, that isn't something that should be put on biracial kids. And 
the world wasn't ready to accept my children if they were biracial because it needed a biracial children to truly exist fully as themselves completely. They need a world in which the racism doesn't exist almost. Yeah, this is they are. And 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 that just doesn't happen. So until until it was a better situation, I wasn't going to have, I wasn't going to bring my child into that world. Mm-hmm. But you have, you've gone ahead and had, you've got well, some. Yes, yes, I know. Um, so because that stuck with me, that was that really stuck with me. And another thing that happened as I was growing up was uh, when we came from Nigeria, we came with my mum by herself. My dad was behind, stayed behind in Nigeria. And, um, and my mum is the white parent. And um, she had cancer. She had actually quite um, advanced cancer. So she had to go and undergo a lot of chemo and a lot of sessions and everything. So we were put into foster care quite often uh, and sometimes long term, long term, like a few months. And in the homes that we were in, the children were in children's homes, there were never any, uh, there, were black, there were a lot of black children there in a, in, a, in a city with hardly any black people. We went into the children's home and it was like, oh, this is where they all are. <laughs> and um, they were the kids that never got taken out. They were the kids that didn't get foster parents. And I remember when I, so two things, I remember when I was there saying, okay, when I'm grown up, I am going to adopt or foster children because mm-hmm. I am going to be the one that comes through the door and the black and the, and, and the, and the brown kids know that they have a chance rather than just the white kids coming through, the white people coming through the door. And that stuck with me my whole whole time and and I ended up my first child was actually adopted from Nigeria because it was something I was going to do um but then what happened was it was so perfect what happened with my daughter that I got my husband and I got really really scared about how we could replicate it how we could make it happen in exactly the same way again but she was just awesome and it just worked so wonderfully so then we decided to have a birth child because um, I didn't know how to do it again the way I did it with my daughter. Mm-hmm. So, so we, I have one, I did it once and I didn't do it the other time to answer your question. Very nice. Um, okay, let's move on to the, the feature because there's so much to talk about there. Shoot the Messenger. I don't know how it is that I managed not to see this film when it came out in 2006, but um, I just saw it recently and I was blown away. I thought it was so clever, so brilliant, so incisive. Um, And so you take us on a journey with Joe, who is something of an anti-hero. Credit to David Oyelowo because he somehow makes this guy likable, even though he's spouting all this craziness. Um, so, you know, uh, he's always spouting this anti-Black sentiment and, you know, you're dealing with issues here of internalized racism, racism not too far off of what you were dealing with in the first film. Um, but the internalized racism is not something we see a lot on film. Can you talk about tackling that theme for, for us all to see? Um, yeah, so, I mean, you know, a lot of, a lot of it starts with the writer, Sharon. And um, and although it's not autobiographical, of course, the film for her, what it was was it, it came from a place in her. She she had some disabilities, and she was growing up in uh, London, and uh, she'd gone through the foster care system as well. And um, um, not for long, not, not the way, but she'd been in there, and basically she felt on a lot of levels rejected by the black community herself, especially by black men. Yeah, she wasn't she was attractive, she wasn't, it, they didn't see her. So there was a case, so there was a place of hurt, and she I think I mean, she says this, there was a place of hurt inside her for her relationship within the black community. And 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 then that whole idea of um, the things that we do, the things that we do to ourselves in terms of you know trying to straightening our hair, sleeping with tips on our noses, all these things that were just never really being um, explored. So that was her starting point from the, the film. And, and you know, 
she always said and she got I was the director so I got when when some of the reviews or some of the uh, feedback came out when the film first came out there was some negativity from black people on the whole not but I'm just saying there was some pushback um but she got it the most because she was the writer so they understood that it was coming from inside her head mm-hmm. and um and she just kept saying over and over again, and it's the same for, for Joe. It's the fact that she loved being black and loved being in the black community so much that when she was rejected, it hurt all the more. So it was kind of like, um, it's dealing with, yes, it's been dealing with internalized racism, but it's also dealing with your her own relationship and the kind of, what racism has done as well to us as a community in terms of how we look at different things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I can understand that. It, it, it's funny because it's not such a a unique story because a lot of us, you know, in America and other countries, we have, we suffer from this internalized racism, you know, And I've suffered greatly at the hands of other Black people who have things to say about how Black I was or how Black I wasn't or how dark I was or wasn't or nappy my hair was or wasn't. And it's it's really insidious that we do this. But so it was brave of you. I mean, you didn't write the story, but you did choose the story um, to tell this story and put it on screen and to, you know, air our dirty laundry. You know, this is something that Black people talk about amongst ourselves often, but not on the big screen. So, you know, did you get pushback? Were were the critics kind to you? Well, like I said, we did get pushback. I mean, on the whole, we did. And on the whole, Black people in Britain especially were really receptive to it because I think, you know, there were two Black stories that were being told. There was always this one about, you know, oppression or slavery or our kind of how painful basically it is to be black and how hard it is and da, 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 da. And I'm not putting those stories down. We need those stories there, but I'm saying, uh, and then the other story was comedies, like lots of, you know, yeah, black just being, you know, fun, dancing, having, making jokes. And yeah. basically they were the only two narratives that really got any mainstream exposure. And mainly it was the latter, mainly it was lots of, you know, Beverly Hills Cop, lots of black, comedy mm-hmm. so there was a there, there was a hunger to see something different like a different um story and you know that's the point you know because white people have told so many stories they've got every variation of stories out there but you know black stories you it's just so much about so limited what we had especially then things have moved on so there was a real hunger to talk about it, and, and there was an acknowledgement that you know we can't be restrained as artists or filmmakers or consumers by how other people see us. Yeah, so we can't, you know, that that old thing about um, I hate eating fried chicken in public because when people look at me, they think, oh yeah, there's another black person eating fried chicken, but I love fried chicken. Yeah, <laughs> it's a way that we feel that we as individuals represent the entire community we are judged by the entire community and we must represent the entire time and that that really limits the discourse it really limits what is being said television movies that our space too yeah so mm-hmm. if we want to make these kind of stories we can make them and we don't always have to think oh my god there's these people listening in and how will they perceive it because that will just stunt us continually. We won't get to do it. So there, there was a huge acknowledgement of that. and um, But there was definitely some pushback. There was definitely some people that said, look, this is, yes, I get it, but this is what we need to talk to about amongst ourselves. But you can't limit yourself. Otherwise, you have to wait to have complicated mm-hmm. discussions or to show other parts of yourself. Mm-hmm. And I was very, very happy to do that. I mean, Sharon's original title for the script was Fuck Black People. <laughs> oh my. She even sent me the script. But um, it was written with so much love.
a um, sympathetic character, mm -hmm. but I always found him a sympathetic character because he was doing it from a position of, it wasn't from hatred, it was the opposite. He wanted mm -hmm. to be in the, he, he wanted to be a part of it. Right. I mean, he says as much at the beginning of the film. He said that he had a good job. He left a good paying job to go help black children. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's good. So, yeah, it's all right there. But it was so, it was very cleverly done the breaking the fourth wall and the like saturated reds in the scene, you know, the soundtrack. I really feel like it was ahead of its time. <laughs> What'd you say? I said, you know what? This is the thing about the red. That's um, good. Yeah. Yeah, what was that about? Can you talk about that choice? No, I mean it was it was really a creative thing. It was just that I wanted to get the um, I wanted to get the visualizations of those worlds really right as a filmmaker. But as you know, or maybe you don't, but I'm I'm Nigerian and uh, Sharon was West Indian. And when you go to those people, when you go to your mom's houses or those houses, yeah, they intend to be incredibly colorful and storage and don't throw this away and this for this and pans for this and that that I didn't that aesthetic it can be quite complicated on screen and it can also be quite it gives it a documentary feel and all that. so I was trying to find a way to um to represent that correctly on screen but not for it to kind of cloud the screen or mess the screen up. So the rule was we couldn't have any pattern things and we could we were going for block colours. But when we were trying to say something, when I wanted it to pop, the only colour that was allowed to pop was the red. Yeah, mm -hmm. So we could have this um, we should, we could we could have colour representation, but in a in a subdued background, which also represented the world that Joe was was living in. So it was a bit of an art, it was a bit of an arty thing, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. art. But it was fun. It was, you know, your your film had a lot of surprises in it. There's nothing formulaic or you know expected or stereotypical about it at all um and so how are you feeling nowadays that I feel like black filmmakers were in that box you're talking about constricted to telling the five stories that we're allowed to tell um and now we have you know get out and black panther and uh, you know a wrinkle in time just like the whole spectrum of things how are you feeling no, I think that I think that's great. And uh, Steve McQueen, who's just done this really great series uh, of British television, um, he said, you know, we need to be able to make our crap films. We need to make, make our art. We need to make da, 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 da. And I think we are getting there. You know, I think it's amazing. I just think it's like, um, you know, when I went to see Black Panther, I'm not a, a superhero fan, but it was like, I'd be like, oh my God, I've been waiting for this film my whole life. And I didn't know I'd been waiting for it. It was just. Yeah, we all were. Yeah. We are. We all felt that, yeah. Um, but you know, my kids are their their expectations now are much higher. So I look back and think, isn't it great? You know, we have a superhero, we have comedies, we have this, we have that, we have the other, and they're happy. You know, my kids are happy, but they want more. They they notice their baseline is higher than our baseline was. So it's like there is still a long way to go. But it's so great that you can go and see a film like Moonlight, you can go and see a horror movie, you can see that, and you know, we don't get killed in the first act. And it's just, you know, it's just, I, I, I love it. But obviously, there's a huge, there's, um, you know, an incredible amount of work to still do. But it's, um, it's a, you know, so much better than when hmm, I was. Yeah. It's a luxury for our kids, you know. They grew up most of their life. They had a black president, you know. <laughs> it's a luxury that they get to be critical, you know, yeah. and a certain level, and not have to see every black film that comes out just because it's it's the black film that's out right now. So we're we're progress is being made. I'm I'm very yeah, hard. It really is. It really is. It's, it's, it's a long way to go, but it's such, such you know, seeming flame. Like you've just got a whole different range of. Films out there, they tend only to be the one or the two, but it's there. There was one fantastic week when I think I could choose between Kevin Hart had just released something, and there was, was it Get Out, and there was Moonlight. It was just, I can't remember what this, but it was, I could like, oh, I can go and see a horror movie tonight. Oh, I can see a love story. Oh, oh, oh. And I was <laughs> brilliant. So speaking of um, 
you know, the Hollywood thing, you got to work with David Yellow when he was younger, you know, before he did his Black Panther and, uh, I'm sorry, the Butler and Selma and Queen of Catway, and Daniel Kaluuya, who, was, who did Black Panther and Get Out. Uh, how did you come across these? Did you recognize that they were going to be the stars that they had become? David, for sure. And, you know, to be honest, David was, uh, he was in a, a reasonably big TV show in England at the, at the time, I think, on Spooks, Spooks. Um, and, you know, he'd been at the Royal Shakespeare Company. So I don't think I, you know, I just, I didn't discover him. Um, mm -hmm. But, and, and I really wanted to work with him. He's, he's just uh, great on set. He's so collaborative and he's so, I don't think it's by accident that he's worked with a lot of female directors because he is a really strong presence on set. With Daniel, it was a whole different process because um, uh, it was his very, very first, speaking role, very first paid role, everything. Mm. And it was, uh, because there's a group of four kids, young men. It was very hard to get actors that young with experience. And it was just, it, it was still one of the best experiences I've had because they were so excited because they were like young black men in some essentially working class backgrounds. But they're not the kind of people the BBC normally rang up to be anything other than, you know, criminals in the bill of obviously that present a bar like a talk show. So um and they were all just so receptive and you know they stayed longer, they came yeah, earlier yeah. and the thing with Daniel was yeah. when it wasn't his scene, he would still be, you know, he didn't have a big part. But he was watching the whole time, he was looking and he was listening. And um I am not the least bit surprised that he's gone on to be yeah, yeah. it's nice to see I rewind it a couple times like is that is that and I was like yes it is him yeah, he, was, like, he was a baby there was baby yeah. was seven, maybe he was, he was 16 and I remember him saying oh this is what I want to do for the rest of my life mm -hmm. and luckily enough uh, he, he is yeah. um, so what have you been doing in, in quarantine what are you doing to stay uh, creative <laughs> no, well, my plan was I wrote, I took some time out to write a novel. Yeah. It was actually originally a, a commission from the BBC, but it's set in Africa and Britain and it was this period and it had a war going on and everything. The BBC didn't make it um, because of the expense, because it was a war period. So um, I decided to write it as a novel because in a novel you can write what you want. You can write in the middle of night, 300 aeroplanes, kamikaze. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't matter. It's on the page. You don't have to replicate it. Right. Uh, but it's intense because it's semi autobiographical. It was very intense and also it's very different writing a novel to writing um, a script. You know, you have to put so much descriptive stuff in. It's like for me, I had to describe the tree instead of saying the tree. Um, so, um, so the plan was that I finished the first draft, which I did, and we were gonna, I'd written a short, um, and we were supposed to start shooting that short. Um, and then COVID happened. I just, we just kept putting it back two months at a time. We can't absorb that level of cost in terms of um, COVID, making things COVID safe. We're, the catering has to work, the set has to work, everything is just it's adding, it's adding a lot of money to budget. So, uh, because what I wanted to do was I wanted to put the manuscript to one side for six or seven months and then come back and do the second draft completely fresh. Um, but basically, what I now we've put off the film until summer next, from summer 21, because I don't think this world is going to change properly until mm -hmm. summer 21. And so I've been writing again and start uh, working on a, a, a mini series for Nigeria, in Nigeria. Um, and um, yeah, that's what I've been doing. A lot of teaching, a lot of panels, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Great. What do you teach? Film, women in film, black history, women in film. Um, All of the above. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, it was really nice catching up with you and talking to you about your work. Um, I am a fan. I'm looking forward to seeing what you create next. And we get to see your voice unadulterated as a, as a novel. Um, it will be a treat. So thank you so much, and Dulce, it's great talking to you. Thanks, everybody, tuning in for joining us today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the AFS series.